Today on Rambling About Cars, tiny trucks and big trucks. Ford Maverick is out. Toyota Land Cruiser is out. And Smith is alive. You're alive. Tiny, tiny truckers around the world is podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. Across the way is Chris Bruce. I missed you last week, man. Yeah, I missed you too. I wish I wish you could have been here. I wish you could have been here to uh, to watch me turn myself inside out. Over, yeah, I don't want to be there watching over, you vomit and hallucinate. And so I'm over, glad I was here. And over, well, I tell you, I mean, I, I got to share this really quick because just to let folks know, I got really sick last week, like like sicker than I've been in decades. And I mean, I was even, I was, I swear, I was completely dead. Heart was stopped. I was at the pearly gates. Looking across the way was the most majestic, endless thing too you've ever parking. seen. No, no, no. It's better than that. This endless parking lot that went on for infinity of every single vehicle that you could ever possibly want. Even the weird concepts that never made it off of a piece of paper. They were there and the almighty was there with a big box of keys and I could drive anything I want. And I said, nope, I got to go answer Ferrari guy from a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so Ferrari guy, if you're listening, you commented. You, you were said invited we on the show, friend. Ferrari you, guy. You said we don't know anything invited. about cars. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I want to talk to that guy. So sorry, I can't die yet. I've got to get back to rambling about cars. So I'm glad to be here. Well, viewers, I have to start the show with an <laughs> apology. Um, we said when we talked about the Ford Lightning that we would have a moratorium on Ford topics for a month. Apparently, I lied. Damn I didn't it, mean to lie, but Ford went and they unveiled the Maverick. I believe either three to four weeks on the dot from when they unveiled the Lightning. And Smith and I, we talked about it, and I initially pushed back because I, I wanted to stay true to my word. But we can't and, not talk about the Maverick. Yeah, and I'm with you on that. I didn't really want to talk about it. But I mean, it's really important. It's really important. It It's legit big news. And yeah. one of the things that we really feel like not just we want to do, but sort of a of a duty here when there's really big car news, you're listening to us and you're trusting us. We need to bring you the really big car news, even if it's more Ford news. So and and I mean, let's be honest, Bruce, a, a new small pickup truck with a blue oval badge, a, a new small pickup truck anywhere is pretty big news in the United States, but with Ford doing this. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we have to talk about it. So I was actually thinking about this while I was doing dishes tonight. And I think there is an argument to be made that the Maverick is more important than the lightning. I totally. Uh, and, and, I what think so. I, and the lightning is obviously very important. It's Ford entering the electric truck market. That's going to be huge in the future, but the Maverick is, a truly, truly affordable small truck for people that want one. It, you know, my, our former colleague, Steve Ewing would get mad at us for saying that it starts at $20,000 because yeah, the destination is 1195 or something like that. But for the very, very low twenties, you can now get yourself a pickup truck. That's fair. That is a fairly decent pickup truck. It doesn't have F-150 or Ranger mm -hmm. levels of capability, but a lot of people don't need F-150 or Ranger capability. And it's finally here after decades of a lot of people, a lot of people in like our comment sections asking for it. And it's here. And I think that's a really big deal. Well, I think it's I think it's bigger than that, though, because how many times have you heard me preach about well, and a lot of people have heard me preach about Ford being completely short sighted, putting all of its eggs in one basket, mm -hmm. basing everything that it's about on trucks and SUVs, not having anything on the lower end of the price range that's also good on gas. And now here we have a small truck. I mean, let's be honest. It's still, I mean, it's still not super entry level. I mean, just over 20, just over 20 grand. It's a the it's, average it's, car these days is what? 33 K. So like, yeah, 20 and, something that's and entry people, level. And how many people are going crazy into debt and even looking at bankruptcy just to afford a, a so, so middle of the road car. I mean, prices are way up there. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is at the, at the bottom of, of the scale. 
Um, it's also a truck, which, hey, in America, people love trucks. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger deal here is Ford is claiming this will get 40 miles per gallon in the city. So yep. when and yes, when gasoline and oil prices go way back up to where it's just absolutely insane to even try to fill up an F-150, when the housing bubble pops, when the economy pops, it will happen eventually. Of course Ford, Ford, at least now with the Maverick, has something that might save them I, I mean am i am i going am i stretching it there um i, I mean when uh, you're stretching when this, it just barely like but you're right that they well, have a truly attractive entry-level product that i don't think just take it side by side you have an eco sport or you have a maverick i can't <laughs> imagine the person that's going to buy an eco sport when the maverick is a couple of grand more like yeah, I mean the the price difference now, but but here's another thing though. Here's another thing that we have to mention. Automakers always love to tout their starting price. Sure. But how sure. many vehicles do they sell at that starting price? Very how, few. How many how many of these base model Ford Maverick XLs that are just front wheel drive, no options, no other equipment? At I think it's a, it's you know twenty one grand or so once destination is figured in, mm -hmm. how many of those are they going to sell? How many are you even going to be able to go into a dealership and find? I bet I bet that absolute base model truck will be something that you can only special order. Um, but I mean, but that said, you should still be able to go into a dealership and probably find what a twenty five thousand dollar XLT or so. I think that's that's about where the XLT is going to start. Right, that's what I was just looking up. I believe that okay. even like. You know the nicer ones are still sub thirty. Yeah. Um, I, let yeah. Me I mean, my numbers up here. I mean, I I give Ford credit for keeping the price down on this. I give Ford credit for coming out with um, the hybrid model is actually the base model, mm -hmm. and that's what I think one hundred ninety one horsepower. Is that correct, Bruce? Well, here, let me give you a pricing first. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's take so a look at the price, and then we'll jump back in. Entry level is nineteen nine ninety five. This is all before destination for an XL. Mm -hmm. twenty two two eighty for an XLT, and twenty five four ninety for the Lariat, which is the range topping version right now. Okay, um, so so I mean, you so eh, that's even a little bit better than I thought. Shame on me for not looking at your pricing article. <laughs> I. I, I I feel very bad for that. It's it's been a very busy few days for us. You've been sick as a dog, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'll give you some slack here. Um and yeah, and that's um the Maverick is stock standard with their hybrid powertrain. That's the two point yeah. five liter. Uh, and yeah, that's one hundred ninety one combined horsepower, yep. horsepower hundred and fifty five pound feet of torque. I mean, not not a huge uh, not a huge number, but like you said earlier, how many people really need the full capability of a full-size pickup truck i'm gonna probably ruffle some more feathers here even more than i did with supra 90 <laughs> percent I'm, I'm pulling this i'm pulling this percentage completely out of the sky 90 percent of full-size truck buyers do not use their truck anywhere near what they need in a full-size vehicle not anywhere near. 90 percent of full-size truck owners would use this Ford Maverick without any issue. And they would be paying a lot less. They would be paying a lot less at the pump, but it, it's not a full-size truck. And it doesn't have a frame underneath it. It's, it's nope. a unibody. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's my little rant there. Um, but if you, if you want to step up to the Maverick all-wheel drive uh, with the two-liter turbo, that's 250 horsepower. That's the EcoBoost engine. I mean, we've, we've seen that before, so no big deal there. Um, that does get your tow rating up to 4,000 pounds and that's, and I'll talk about this in a bit. That's the maximum you can tow with the Ford Maverick. It, when you have it equipped with the two liter turbo with the all wheel drive, and you have to have a, a special tow package to, to mm -hmm. get to the 4,000 pound race. So, I mean, it's, that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty capable for a small truck, right? And I'm looking at the pricing post that I wrote up earlier this week, yesterday, technically. Um, the tow package is $745. So okay, it so, doesn't I mean, exactly a, break the bank. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a big add-on. No. It's that's not a big add-on at all. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, bravo for Ford to, to bringing this out, uh, for putting this out there. Um, what, what I find interesting, and, and actually before we jump into this, 
we have so much information at motor1.com right now on the Ford Maverick. If there's anything that uh, we don't talk about here, just seriously, motor1.com. I don't even know if you have to search for Maverick. There's probably something near the top of the news feed, but search for Maverick. We search have some Yeah, I think some of our features that we wrote are debut. kind of moved down a little bit. So just go ahead and search for Maverick. Yep. And of course, I mean, we'll drop links in our uh, in our podcast post that mm-hmm. goes up every Friday. So much there. Um, I did the comparison with the Maverick and the Hyundai Santa Cruz, because let's be honest, it's the only other truck in this category right now in the, in the United States. Yep. It's an obvious comparison. And we talked about the Santa Cruz. Well, what was it a few weeks back, Bruce? Here on, the, on the podcast back now, I think. Has getting, it been that long? Yeah. Wow. Dude. This year's going quick. But it's yeah. it's oh it's going so 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 quick. Um, but I mean, obviously, those comparisons are going to happen. So course, I was like I was happy said, to it's dive. The into only it. other vehicle on the market that it competes with in the United States right now. Mm-hmm. So it, it, we have to compare them. There's no and, other comparison, right? <laughs> You know, unless Ram, if you're listening, uh, you have a you have a Fiat that you can bring over pretty much as is, <laughs> and uh, and call it you know you know brand it your new entry level Ram. Um, I think that'd be a, a cool matchup. But anyways, and we're wait, talking wait, about Santa super Cruz. quick. Wait, wait. Oh, oh, so oh, anyone, oh. if you want to listen to our Santa Cruz rambling about cars, that was on April 23rd, and that is April 16th, depending on how you want to find that. So either okay. episode 16, April 23rd, if you want to hear everything about the Santa. Cruz. Cruise, so okay yeah well that wasn't too long ago april 6th so for a month t- yeah okay B- about almost two months anyways ah <sighs> comparison ford obviously they were really i mean we'll be honest they were really conservative with the styling on maverick and let's and i mean they can be they're ford they sure. don't have to come out and try to rock the boat with some sort of new pickup truck because they already have that audience built in so i mean yeah. And and comparing looks, I, I hate comparing looks because that's in that's in the eye of the beholder, right? Mm-hmm. I personally dig the way the Santa Cruz looks better than Maverick, just because, I, you know what? We've seen it, we've seen it over and over again. Not that the Maverick's ugly; it's just kind of yeah. What really got me, and I don't think I've heard anybody really talking about this yet. What do you always hear from Detroit automakers when they debut a new truck? You hear one of several things, best in class towing, best in class power, best in class cargo capability. They don't sometimes they'll talk about best in class fuel economy, but that's usually for a diesel because, I mean, even if they're saying best in class fuel economy, I mean, you might be looking at 20 miles per gallon. It's it's not really a, you know, a, a double take. Those are the I mean, those are staples. I mean, those aren't just talking points. Every time you hear a new truck from Detroit come out, they're touting one of those categories. Except now. 2022 Ford Maverick. The only competitor it has in its category is the Hyundai Santa Cruz. And guess what, folks? The Santa Cruz beats it for power. The Santa Cruz beats it for towing. The Santa Cruz beats it for cargo capability. The only thing that Maverick does is beat it for fuel economy. And isn't that kind of reversed? I mean, isn't don't we usually see it the other way? Don't we usually see it the other way around? Yep. Uh, I I mean, I mean, let let, let me go over the stats here. So maximum tow capability for Maverick, all wheel drive, 4,000 pounds. That's you need the towing package. Santa Cruz, if you have the 2.5 liter turbo four, you'll get 5,000 pounds of towing capability. Um. If you have the Santa Cruz all-wheel drive with that turbo four, 275 plus horsepower. They don't have a specific figure yet. The most you get with uh, Maverick, 250. And even in the torque department, Hyundai, Santa Cruz all-wheel drive, they're saying 310 pound-feet plus. They don't have it finalized yet uh, of torque. Uh, Maverick, 277. So, again, a win there. Um, as far as cargo capability, it's really close. Ford maxes out at 1,500 pounds. Hyundai goes up to 1,748. I, it's, such a, it's such a weird number, but hey, it's more. So, I mean. But just it, real quick in the Ford's fa- favor, not that I'm favoring one over the other. The Santa Cruz's bed is a bit smaller. 
Yes. It's, you know, it's 4.3 feet long versus 4.5 feet long. Well, you know, and it, but also it depends on where you measure it from, because if you have that yeah. built in tunnel cover, yeah. it's only like four feet at the top. Correct. You're right. Santa Cruz. Yep. Yep. That is an area where pickup truck people are really going to favor the Maverick because Ford even they designed the bed in the Maverick. It's it's a four and a half foot bed, but they designed it to where it's it's flat enough. They actually designed the uh, the wheel arches in the bed where you can fold down the tailgate and the tailgate even has a, a multifunction little lip that kind of sits up and they designed it. So, OK, you can set a four by eight sheet of plywood there in the back. The four by eight sheet of plywood fits between the uh, the bed just fine. It sits on those flat spots mm-hmm. on the uh, on the wheel wells and then it rests on that on the tailgate. Of course, it's sticking way out the back. You better have a stinking orange flag on the back of your of your load. But still. You go down to the hardware store. You can throw a four by eight sheet of plywood in, in the back. That's a big deal for people. That's a that's a that would be one area where I would say the full size truck people legitimately use their vehicles to the max. When you go and you can carry longer, kind of bulkier loads like that. And props to Ford; they've got the Maverick figured out to where you can do that. Whereas Hyundai, you've got your little uh, plastic cover that you're putting over the tailgate so you can haul your mountain bike. So that's the one thing there. I don't know. And it, I think it's just going to matter person to person, family to family. I know in the family that I am from, they are very much gardeners and being able to haul the the mulch, the stone, the stuff like that. That's a much bigger deal than hauling plywood or drywall or stuff like that. So, you know, maybe that extra payload is going to put the Santa Cruz in their favor versus the Maverick. You know, they're not really going to care that there's a smaller space, that more the extra weight is the selling point. So it, right. it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. Do you want more payload, less physical space or more physical space, but less actual payload? It, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it shakes down interestingly. Um, I can tell you from personal experience over the last year, I would rather have the space over the payload. Um, speaking as somebody that went a little crazy and built a sim racing cockpit out of a bunch of plywood last year when we were on lockdown, I really could have used space for some nice four by eight sheets of plywood. Um, and then I also just got a new bed after uh, 17 years out of my old bed, trying to get rid of the queen bed with a queen size box spring. Yeah, the, the, the space would help. But at the same time, you I mean, you have space in the Hyundai it's not quite as convenient to use, but it's still an open space. I'm sure people can figure out a way. Right. To we're make talking it, about to, less to make than a foot work. here. Yeah, we're not yeah. talking if, about if they, the, if they you have know, to. Right. We're talking about a less less than a foot in either dimension. People are going to figure it out. It's just right. you know it it it's just an interesting dichotomy between them. Mm-hmm. So when we're looking at the interior, um, if you're catching us on YouTube, Bruce, I mean. I, I don't really know how I feel about the Maverick interior versus Hyundai. Um, I mean, we're seeing the XLT. The, is that? I think that's the XLT Lariat, probably. Yeah. It's, it's gonna be. It's gonna be the dressed up one. And, I, I mean, think it, that's the Lariat to actually. Hey, hey, you know what? I mean, Ford does. I mean, they know how to do handsome interiors. But I mean, I kind of dig Hyundai's interior too. I actually thought that they were there was some notable similarity in just kind of the basic design. So looking at them both. I think I personally prefer the um, the Santa Cruz interior. I really like its di- digital instrument cluster and the way its infotainment system kind of incorporates. It's a little bit more avant-garde though with kind of the the weird trapezoid in the steering wheel at the lower section of the steering wheel. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's close, you know, it is what it is. So for anyone watching us on YouTube, you are looking at the Ford now, and I'm going to put up an image of the Santa Cruz right I, now. I, oh, you got so it. You okay. Can, yeah. I got, yeah, I got, I got it right here. Up too. Okay. Nope, I got it right here. Um, it, You're quicker on the draw than I am, man. You uh, always are this every time. Well, here we go. The, uh, I mean, I the, just the, a matter the, of preference. I like the Santa Cruz better. It's a, but it just looks a little bit more high tech. And it's going to depend on the person. If you prefer a more conventional look, you're probably going to like the Ford. If you want to go a little bit more avant-garde high tech, I think you're going to like the Hyundai better. But I don't think one is better than the other. The steering wheel is a little awkward looking on the Hyundai, but it's not terrible. It is. That's Um, that's what I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
it's a toss up for me. I don't think I would be buying either one based on the interior just because I think they're they're both similar enough uh, to seal the deal for me. Here, uh, I would be looking more for. Well, I mean, let's be honest. And I think a lot of people will agree here. They're going to be looking more necessarily at, at price here. And we don't yet know what Hyundai is going to sell the Santa Cruz for. They, they haven't announced any pricing yet, have they? I, I don't uh, think I've seen it that, anywhere. I, yeah. Wait, here, real quick. Here are the two side by side for any of our YouTube viewers. Yep. Smith, you're looking at them. To me, it's a wash. Like they both have their strengths and minuses. I prefer the Santa Cruz one a little bit more, but I could also totally understand why someone would like the Ford one mm-hmm. more. It's it, it's a wash to me. You Ford, GM, Stellantis, aka Jeep and and Dodge. Yeah. I like the shifter stock. I don't like the little dial. But I know the Maverick has the dial. You can see it there at the bottom. Oh no! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, that's I'm drive selector. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying I I don't like that. I would rather just have this the same old basic stock where I I have the tactile feel. Okay, I don't have to look down to see. Okay, d- did I dial it here? Did I dial it there? I don't but, know if it makes if it makes me old fashioned, but I just I just like I like having that stock, even if it's a small stock. The one in the one in the Santa Cruz, it's, it's kind of big actually. I don't think it needs to be that big. But what I like about I like the Maverick that. are the physical dials and buttons for the HVAC system. To yep. me, that is a better implementation. I have not seen a good digital HVAC system control setup yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I prefer that in the Ford, but still. If you ask me for my preference, I take the Hyundai, but it's close. I, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't see anybody making or breaking their decision based on yeah, the interiors here. It's going to be hard on um, that one. It, it's going to come down to exterior, whether you like the conservative Ford look or the the little more exciting Hyundai look. Um, I don't think, even though Hyundai beats Ford at the truck game, if you will, with uh, with power and towing and cargo. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it'll come down to that either because they're still they're still very similar. They're, they're similar on, on all of those fronts. And I don't see anybody towing four or five thousand pounds with either one of these vehicles, even no. even if they're even if they're able. I don't see anybody doing that. I think it's going to come down to which one you like better in terms of looks and price. And on that, well, Hyundai, the ball's in your court. Maybe maybe Hyundai has been holding themselves back to see what Ford's going to do with their Maverick now that. Ford has shown its hand and it's a pretty aggressive hand. If Hyundai is going to be competitive, I mean, it's going to have to start in the low twenties. How cool would it be if Hyundai could come in and actually we'll say 18, nine plus destination and have it, have it check in at like 19, nine 95. I don't think that's going to happen. I, um, I don't think it will either, but man, I would love to see Hyundai do it. <laughs> so here's the, so we are pretty certain the Santa Cruz has a lot of relationship with the Tucson. Am I right there? Yeah. Okay. So I am looking at Tucson pricing right now. The new Tucson starts at twenty four nine fifty. I think the Santa Cruz is going to be you know plus or minus a grand from there. It's not going to be significantly more. It's not going to be significantly less. So based on well, that, I don't know. I think I don't know either. I'm guess I'm yeah. guessing just like you are, but yeah. I'm just looking at what the information I have. Um, I think you're going to end up the base price of the Tucson's going to end up being a little bit more, but not significantly more than the Ford. I think they're both going to be in the twenties, but you know maybe you're going to end up paying three to four grand more for a Santa Cruz. That's think, my guess offhand. I mean, I think if if Hyundai can come in, um, say at 21 or 22 that might be a, that might be hard be, but maybe that, that might be a stretch well uh, here's another theory okay so they come in at 23 okay i would believe that they come in at 23 for the base model but what's the most expensive ford maverick because their configurator is already up isn't it over 40 grand and i wrote that post and i will explain to you that yes the most expensive maverick is forty two thousand eight hundred and thirty five dollars but Ford's configurator has a ton of accessories on right. it. And I can't imagine a buyer that is going to pick every <laughs> humanly possible accessory to put on that truck like we did. Yes, they're not going to pick the $200 um, you know, valve stem 
caps or you know the, the, right. the crazy things that they offer like that so on. here just real quick here is what you can do to the bed and just kind of add this up in your mind you can get a 300 dollars bed divider kit you can get a $370 bed extender. You can buy a $180 bed liner tray, $200 for bed lighting, $70 for a bed net for your stuff. There's a $280 toolbox that you can mount to the driver or passenger side. There's a soft folding tonneau cover. There's a hard folding tonneau cover, or there's a hard roll up tonneau cover. The last two of which are $1,160. I can't imagine the person that's going to buy all of that. Right. That person doesn't exist. So right. yes, technically, can you get a $40,000 Maverick? Yes. If you just tick everything, no one's going to do that. No, nobody's going to do that. But the, the point I wanted to make on that is kind of going back to what I said earlier. It may start at 21 grand after destination. Who's going to buy that truck? Very few people are going to buy that right. truck. Most yep, of the I people are that. probably going to be in the mid 20s to i'd say high 20s mid mid to high 20s low 30 yeah. range yeah. so that's really where hyundai needs to be looking at a price comparison so even if they start at 23 if they have a comparable model say you can you can upgrade to their 2.5 turbo which by the way also comes with the eight speed dual clutch transmission i still think that with all-wheel drive that would be a cool ass little street truck yeah if they if they can come if they can bring that in cheaper then you can get an all-wheel drive two liter eco boost all-wheel drive maverick you know what maybe that maybe the win is right there maybe maybe hyundai doesn't need to come in and undercut ford on their base model vehicle because the volume is going to be higher up the chain yeah and as we're talking about this what immediately comes to my mind is that Whoever wins or loses on a corporate side doesn't matter. Consumers are the ones that are winning mm -hmm. because for the first time in ages, there are legit small trucks that are good, that have capability that most people could use that, you know, just it's it's a really great time for people that just want a small truck that has not existed for decades. I know a few people that are clinging to their small rangers like their gold just because and i mean the ranger is all right it i never felt like it set any sort of gold standard for a small truck or any vehicle but the tacoma or you know whatever the yeah. Hilux or whatever you want to call it was always kind of a better truck but more way more expensive but uh, just having the smaller vehicle that still has the capability yeah yeah we're finally getting back to, to that segment It'll be interesting to see how the segment grows, if it mm -hmm. grows, because at least before with the previous small trucks, the Ranger, the S10, I mean, those were still, I guess you would say proper trucks. They were still body on frame, rear wheel drive with optional four wheel drive. It's an important distinction to make here because the Maverick, I mean, it, it's and the Santa say, Cruz and, and Santa Cruz, they're both unibody. They're, they're both unibody design that are front wheel drive and basic trim. That's, I mean, that's not a typical, it's not a typical truck format. And the all wheel drive systems, those aren't your typical four wheel drive systems. Those, those are going to be more of the kind of the, the street based all wheel drive. So you're not going to take your Maverick even with all wheel drive and go to, go to Moab. I mean, people might try. Right. Although, I mean, we've seen Bronco Sports at yeah. Moab that are doing oh, okay. True, and it's the same platform, which oh, means that's the true. All wheel drive is probably similar. So, oh, that's true. Maybe, maybe I should uh, maybe I should eat a little crow there. I'm well, not. Hey, no, I'm not saying that. We'll I'm see, just saying we'll that you know, we'll for a lot of people, I think the capability might be there. You know, uh, you know, if you live in Alaska or if you live somewhere really, really in the wilderness, no, this probably isn't the truck for you. But if you live in the suburbs. So that all-wheel drive system is probably everything you're ever going to need. Well, I, I mean, I'll say this much. I'm not a truck guy. Um, I'm sure listeners have heard me say that many times. I have owned two full-size trucks, so I'm, I'm not saying this without having any experience. And actually, I, I liked the F-250 diesel that I had. I didn't like it at the time just because it kept breaking down. But I guess with rose-colored glasses, I thought it was kind of neat. Um but I've just I've never been a fan of the ride. I've never been a fan of the size. I'm always kind of practical in that. I, I want a vehicle that I'm at least using mostly how it should be used. The Maverick and the Santa Cruz 
really interest me. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting an exclamation mark on that because I still have my 2004 Mazda 6 V6 hatch that has been extraordinarily practical for me over the years. And it's been extraordinarily reliable, except for very recently, (laughs) except for the past probably eight months or so where I mean, it's only got one hundred nine thousand miles, but it's I mean, it's got a misfire, a slight misfire now that's not strong enough to set a check engine light. So, okay, I I don't exactly know where that's at. The suspension is starting to get worn out. It's got a pretty good oil leak. This is after already fixing a bunch of stuff over the last year. So I'm kind of at the point I've been I've been ho humming on getting a new car. I'm at the point now where it's like I'm kind of tired of this. I can afford something new. Let's go get it. These two trucks really interest me. I'm interested to see how many other people that wouldn't ordinarily be looking at a truck are now interested in either Maverick or Santa Cruz. I agree. So I want to follow up your anecdote with an anecdote of my own. Oh, so um, just this past not last weekend, weekend before last, I got to see my parents for the first time in a while because of, you know, COVID mm-hmm. and vaccinations and stuff like that. And naturally, because I write about cars, we were visiting an uncle of mine who's restoring a car like we're all car people. Cars got brought up. And my dad said that my mom asked him. She had been look. She had read about the Santa Cruz and also the Lightning, and said, "How come we've never owned a pickup truck?" Because they they were always SUV people. They had a Cherokee and a Wrangler, and my mom had a '95 Mustang and a Saab, and a she drives a Cadillac CTS now. Like they've never driven. She likes you know vague performance luxury, but not really a pickup. But the Santa Cruz really grabbed her. She's been asking me over and over again, how much does a Santa Cruz cost? And the lightning really grabbed her because the idea of being able to plug stuff in, especially like, you know, they live in an area where a power outage happens every, you know, a couple times a summer, three times mm-hmm. a summer, but being able to, you know, Oh, they don't have a generator, but they could plug the truck in that that would be kind of attractive to them. Like, the way that the truck market is moving, it's attracting someone who I never expected to want a truck, i.e. my mother. So it, it, it's a really interesting time. It's a really exciting time. It really is. Well, but, I mean, didn't we just see that Ford is now building more Mustang Mach-E's than regular Mustangs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, the argument could be made there still that, well, it's not really a Mustang. You know, that's why they're selling more because it, 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 it's a practical vehicle versus Mustang is a niche vehicle. But, hey, it still comes down to that's sort of a sporty kind of performance vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Interesting times, man. Interesting yeah. times. How interesting are they? Email us a podcast at motor one dot com. Also, hey, email us. Tell us what you think on Maverick and Santa Cruz and this whole small truck thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you thinking about a small truck now where you weren't thinking about a truck before? We'd love to do a little poll and see what our listeners think on that. Yeah, I would really love to know if like, were you thinking about getting a a smallish crossover, a a CRV, you know, a a smallish crossover, but now you're looking at the Maverick and you're like, oh, maybe I could do that instead. Maybe that would work for me. Let us know. I, I would le- legitimately be curious to know people's feelings on that. Yeah. I mean, we always love to hear from people. We always love to read the comments, even sometimes when the comments are a little are a little spicy. Bruce, I wasn't on the podcast last week, but I did listen because, come on, this is the best automotive podcast. Well, it's your it's, show, too. It's, it's the best automotive podcast you can get. It's even better when I'm not on it. No, it's so, better when you're on so, it. But so anyway. I, I, I had to listen. Um, and I know you – we're going to jump back a couple of weeks because we talked mm-hmm. about um, cars that we thought were overrated, cars underrated. that we thought were yeah. underrated. And I think the A80 Super is overrated. And you stirred up a hornet's nest. Like that was all of the comments that people were <laughs> saying that you were only saying that to like get views for us, to like stir well, up controversy. People claimed like – you were just you, you, you were but, being but a you know fake what that means? person saying that. But, but so, you know what that means? Tell me. It means I'm absolutely right. <laughs> because I mean, we started off that podcast by saying feelings were going to be hurt, and some feelings were hurt. Hey, if I'm an idiot because I don't like the A80 Supra, or if I'm dumb because I'm just stirring up controversy, hey, look at the A80 Supra. 
It's got that dumb smiling face with those ridiculously oversized headlights. It has that ridiculous St. Louis arch spoiler that for the younger people that think the Supra is great, but don't remember it from the nineties, people didn't really like that wing in the nineties when it came out, it was kind of like, wow, Toyota, what did you do to the Supra? Why are you putting this huge wing on there? It's got the 2JZ engine. People know the 2JZ engine. They love the 2JZ engine. It's a great engine. The Rightfully engine so. is fantastic. It, it's a fantastic engine. I'd say I'd, I'd put it in one of the top engines of all time. There are so many engines you can put on that list. It certainly deserves to be there. Um, and for the record, also, I don't hate the Supra. I'm not a big fan of the A80. Um, but as a performance car in the 90s, especially when Mustang GTs were at, at like 220, 230 horsepower on a good day stock, and the, the Super was at what, like 330 stock? I mean, it, it, was, it was a properly brutish muscle car. It also um, cost twice as much as a Super, or as a Mustang, sorry. It, it was also very expensive, and because it was a muscle car, I mean, it handled all right, but it, it wasn't what you would expect a Japanese sports car to be. So I mean those those were my big gripes. I think I think Toyota did just terrible on the styling. Um, I think that it could have been dialed in a little bit better for handling, not just brute power. There's more to life than the two JZ. Um, Can I poke the hornet's nest here, just off the top of my head? I, I've got I, a, I, a question I, for you. Okay, you've got a question for me. Okay, go ahead. So lined up right next to each other, you have got twin turbo Supra. Lexus SC400, which in case the 400 is the one with the V8 engine out yep. of the LS and everything. You could pick one. Honestly, I, I would take I would take the Lexus. I just uh, the Lexus looks better. Um, I, I mean, They're the same the two, platform. I, I mean, the, the, yeah, I, like I said, I don't really have a problem with the Supra. I just don't think it is the end all be all that uh, frankly a lot of people make it out to be just based on its appearance in the fast and the furious i mean i mean we were cu- kind of talking about it in that episode yep um jason just- hudson i'm gonna i'm gonna call you out a little bit and i'm using your name on here usually we stay anonymous but yeah we jason- don't use last names usually so you better be nice well, well at least well, have a reason well when you post a public comment on a public forum they are bashing the Mark IV Super just for the controversy of it. They are morons. That's duh. We're morons. Come on, you listen. I mean, people listen to the podcast. <laughs> of course, we're morons. But you know what? Sometimes we're also right. And you know, I mean, I mean, hey, Jason, you love the Super, dude. That's awesome. I'm not. I'm not interested in trashing on anybody. I'm not going to call you a moron. You love the Super. There are some cars that I love that people just don't get. That's not what being a car person is about. You love your car stuff. We love our car stuff. I am legit sorry that we don't see eye to eye on the Supra, but I want to thank you for commenting. And I want you to say, don't worry about all the people who also bashed your comment on our YouTube video. Don't listen to them, even though they might have been agreeing with me that the Supra is cut, that the A80 is kind of ugly. Don't listen to them, man. Keep on with your super love. Keep preaching it. Keep listening. Keep commenting. And the same for Ferrari guy. In fact, Ferrari guy made a comment on our uh, on our post. Guys that know nothing about cars talking about cars. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's. I had a typical. much harsher response to the Ferrari guy <laughs> that I suggested to but, you, and you very kindly said, "I think I'll take this one." But, so uh, hey, Ferrari on, guy, I mean, it could have been worse, bud. <laughs> dude, uh, hey, it's. I mean, it's a troll comment. I mean, we we're we're in the business. We we know what this stuff's about. I know. Um, I, I, I my Ferrari guy. I mean, I, I was legit. I invited you on the show. Hey, come yeah, on. Yeah, totally. If you want to come on the show, you're welcome. Would. Seriously, we're rambling about cars. School us with your knowledge. Um, I mean, I've owned, I've only owned like 34 cars, wrenched on most of them. Um, been wrenching this week, even in 95 degree heat, because the, the damn windows. <laughs> this has been like the story of my life for the past three weeks. It's like one thing breaks, then another thing breaks. 
then I get super sick and then my wife is super sick at the same time. And oh, okay, now here comes a heat wave. None of the air conditioners are in the house. Have you ever been stuck in a house where two people are sick and it's 95 degrees outside well, and so you're too sick your, to put the air conditioner in the window? Your main <laughs> bed was screwed up because you had bought a new bed. So the old bed was like not <laughs> oh, the bedroom. So. We, bought, we, bought a, we bought a new bed. Um, and we were having trouble getting, we wanted a new uh, platform for the bed. So yeah. we had the bed delivered. The bed was delivered on Tuesday, right in the middle when my wife was sick. I wasn't sick at that point yet, but it was like, should you we delay this? Day. I got sick the next day and the bedroom was torn apart. I mean, we were just kind of, we were just like camping it in the house, but we didn't have any super comfortable place to be sick in. And we had to delay putting up the bed because we were waiting for the frame to show up. So Yeah. And then uh, I'm driving the Mustang. The Mustang has awesomely cold air conditioning, but I left the top down over the weekend. And sometimes I just leave it down because I'm not driving it all the time. So I left you the top down. The all the down. There, so that's fine. That's- well, but but then I got sick, so I didn't drive it for a few more days. And apparently, those 25 year old rear windows have some dead spots on them. So I finally I go to drive. It's like, oh, I just need to turn the air on. And the rear window, one rear window won't go up. I drive over some rough railroad tracks, figuring, okay, I'll just, I'll just shake the hell out of the car. That window goes up. I get to the house. The other one won't work now. So I tear the back seat apart. Everything. I, I, I spend like an hour tearing all the, the trim out just so I can tap on the motor for five seconds. And it goes right up. It's like, it's like damn you. So I, I do all that. It's like, okay, hey, it's super hot out here. I just want to, I just want to have the air on when I'm out driving. So I go out, turn on the air. It does not come on. Oh, I hadn't heard that part of the story. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the new part. So that, yeah, that's what I'm doing. That. That, that's that's what I'm doing this weekend. Um. Anyways, the thank you, commenters. See, Ferrari guy. This is See, why you need to talk to us. Th- this is this is why you need to talk to us. So you can you can help me diagnose the uh, the air conditioning <laughs> issue on the Mustang. And I know the problem. I know exactly what you're going to say. The problem is the problem is that stupid blue oval on the grill. That messes everything up all the time. <laughs> I know I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that blue oval off and I'm going to get a little square yellow prancing horse. And that may or may not fix the air conditioning, but I but guarantee all the bills will be four times more expensive. The bills will be four times more expensive. And like next month, I'll have to do a timing service where That's the right. engine will have to come out of the car. Anyways. That's right. Thank you for commenting. And you know, I, can I segue just, just briefly before we get into our next, uh, our next segment. Yeah. Uh, since, why not? since, since we're talking about supers here, here um, you guys, you and Anthony, refresh us really quick on the on the other commenter that we had that, that was asking about the million dollar, the million yeah. dollar challenge, if you will. I don't have his email pulled up at the moment, but yeah, he right. asked us. He was very nice. He was effusive. He said how much you like the show, and he just wanted to know if we had one million dollars given to us and we could only buy cars with that money. What would we buy? This is one of them. Forget your A80 Supra. Look at this A70. Yeah, that's a good Look looking at, car. I, I mean, I mean, ah, oh, putting that side by side with an A80, the proportions. It's an 80s wedge shape that was the, the thing pro- at the time. Yeah. It was the thing at the time, but I mean, it still looks it still looks sleek and great today, especially with mm-hmm. the removable top. Mm-hmm. The proportions oh, were right, um, and and uh, what. You had a one Jay Z, I think, for those in Japan that were. I mean, that was that was the big engine to get, but in the United States, I mean, we still had the seven uh, uh, M GTE. Am I getting that right, Toyota people? The seven M GTE, I think. So I think that was the. You could get a turbo as well. Uh, that might, it was, the turbo it, might be the one Jay Z, and then the naturally aspirated is the M series because the M series right. is, was what it was in the three thousand GT. Um, okay. which is why it was so famous. Um, um, but I mean, it's still the inline six turbo. That was yeah, about 230 horsepower. I don't care that it doesn't have a two Jay Z under the hood. I don't care that it doesn't have 600 horsepower. I don't care that it doesn't have 330. That car with 230 horsepower, I would take the roof out. I would shift five speeds. I would have glorious fun all day long in that car. I would feel good about myself because it didn't look like a freaking cartoon. <laughs> And I would have gobs of money left over because while you would. people are losing their mind over A80s right now for no real apparent reason other than hype, I can go buy an A70 like that in really nice shape 
for what about probably like 10 or 15 grand and that might even be on the high side it depends think, on where you live yeah like i you think could, these are these are starting to come up now they are yes but i mean that's that's one that's one of my million dollar challenges um I don't think I'm going to have time today because we got we got some Land Rover stuff to talk about. We do. But wait one second, because I'm now looking at the numbers. So you are right. Actually, I was wrong in the U.S. They only got the M family of engines. So you either got a natural naturally aspirated 7M GE or the turbo was the 7M GTE Mm -hmm. uh, uh, engines in the United States. In the in Japan, there was the one JZ. But okay. that was not a U.S. spec engine. So yeah. Okay. So so see uh, see Jason, I'm I'm not a moron. I know Toyota stuff. I'm I'm just not I'm just not buying into the A80, man. That's all. That's all. So uh, hopefully I'm, you're listening. Drop us a comment on what I, what do you think of the A70, man? What does everybody think of the A70? Should I love the A70? Cars, so you're not going to get any bad words from me. Like should should the A70 be a little bit higher up on the rung here than the A80? Just because the A80 had a little bit more horsepower, it doesn't mean the A70 is more deserving. Before we go on to uh, our next segment, I will complete in one fell swoop my million dollar garage challenge. Okay, and that is going to be with. A car that could be the most beautiful, elegant, seductive, delicious car of all time. You're Ladies push and like gentlemen, a Mustang too or something. I present the 1936 Auburn Boat Tail Speedster. Come oh, okay. yeah. on. There is not a place in the world where you could drive up in that and you would not be the instant rock star of everything. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it, it, there, there was a time not too long ago where those cars were still, I mean, you know, 150, 200 grand. That, that's nothing. Oh, to no, they were more. At. That's the interesting thing about those pre-war cars is that they've gone up. And now the fact that so few people kind of know about them, that the prices are falling. No, yeah. no, not not on these. Not on these. Oh, okay. that, that was my initial thought, because the last time I checked, I, it, it had been a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, I guess maybe a little bit longer, but you know, I thought, okay, I can get one of these and a few other cars. No, the, an original Auburn boat tail like this is a million bucks. You're gonna, you're gonna pay. I mean, maybe you can get one for eight hundred. Maybe you can get one for nine. Maybe it goes for one point two, one point four. But you're looking at a million dollar car right there. So okay. there, there's it's my million dollar it. challenge. It's gorgeous. Oh, it it is. Oh, I've always loved that car. The the big straight eight. I mean, at the time that was supercharged, mm-hmm. um, I don't know how, how fast they were, but I mean, this is at a time where there still weren't many roads with pavement, right? <laughs> I mean, this is how long yeah. ago we're talking. And this is a car that could, that could top a hundred miles an hour. It, it's just, there's just nothing else like it when you see it on the road. The only, the only other thing I'll say here, instead of that car, I could get an Auburn boat tail replica and have like 95 percent of the look it's never going to be super exact um for probably about 50 or 60 grand in which case i then created just the most crazy list of pop culture cars 80s cars um i had i had a mercy lago in there because i I always love the mercy lago you gotta have a lago it's like a buck 50 200 oh yeah i had i had a few cars i had a couple cars in there they were like 200 400 thousand yeah, uh, but if you got a million, like, that's- but, but I, yeah, I got a million, right? So, right. you know, I, what else did I have in there? Ferrari 328. I love the 308, but the 328's got a little bit more power. Yeah, I do, and you exactly. can get those for just under 100 grand. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ferrari 575, I love, I've always loved just that long front engine V12 Ferrari. Those are, I think, right or, running right around 100 grand. And then from there, it's just like, this ridiculous list of ten thousand dollar eighties cars. I would have the I would have the ultimate eighties collection. Oh, Dodge, totally. Dodge Daytona Turbo Z. Oh, you can get one of those mint condition for like ten grand. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, the Z thirty one three hundred ZX. Uh, just Turbo Coupe Thunderbirds. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Honda S two thousand. I got to have the S two thousand in there. Um, we'll we'll cover it. A, we'll cover it a different time. But I love that you guys did that. I'm jealous that I didn't get to be a part of it. Um, but we need to we need to talk about the Toyota Land Cruiser. We do because a new Toyota Land Cruiser is here. It's not necessarily here for us, us as in the folks in the United States. By right. all accounts, Toyota is killing the Land Cruiser name here. 
and I say that with a lot of hesitation, and I hope you can hear that in my voice, because yep. I'm not a thousand percent convinced. I wonder, maybe we are not going to get this iteration of the Land Cruiser. Well, you know, we'll probably get it as the new Lexus LX or Lexus whatever. Um, but I would just be shocked that Toyota would give up on the Land Cruiser name in the U.S. for reasons that we'll get into as we go into this conversation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, new Toyota Land Cruiser uh, just debuted kind of a little bit earlier than we expected today. <laughs> uh, in terms of power, it's no longer V8 powered. You either get a twin turbo 3.5 liter V6 that makes 409 horsepower, or you get a 3.3 liter twin turbo turbo diesel that makes 305 horsepower and 516 pound feet of torque. Um, it's riding on a new frame. Um, it apparently drops like uh, 400 and I think 16 pounds over the old one. You know, it's a little bit lighter, but it's still a, just a big, rugged oh, yeah. SUV that, you know, th to put it into perspective, the Land Cruiser is kind of Toyota's Suburban in a certain way, but a Suburban that you could take off road and have no issue ever with it. Um, it's kind of the best way I could express it. I mean, I, I, I know you can, and I've seen the videos, and the videos always just just floor me as to how you can do that with the Land Cruiser. I mean, Toyota certainly has, they have a little bit of pixie dust, I think, mixed in there to, to make the Land Cruiser something that big, be able to do the things that it does. Um, but I, still, I just, I mean, with the lower, with the lower side skirts, well, I, I, I mean, I mean, this is really, I mean, yes, it, it's off-road capable, but I mean, it's, it's really become just a straight up tremendously luxurious full-size SUV. It has, but you know, it's still body on frame. They have been developing this vehicle literally for decades. Like the, f the fact is, is that, you know, non-government organizations, NGOs all around the world, they use Toyota Land Cruisers to get around. Mm -hmm. There are lots of armored versions of the Toyota Land Cruiser. Like mm -hmm. it is known, especially outside of the United States, as kind of the rough and tumble SUV that you get. Um, and for any of our YouTube watchers right now, we are looking at the new range. And the one on the far right is the GR version, which you can see has a completely different grill layout mm -hmm. than the other ones. And God damn, is that car sexy. With, I think it looks really good. It looks so good with that Toyota. <laughs> like it, they're uh, maybe they're kind of sort of ripping off Ford with that big Toyota in the grill, but it looks so good. It's just this big boxy beast of an SUV. Well, I mean, uh, Land Cruisers of old, I mean, they, they used to carry some pretty big branding up front like that, didn't they? I, I don't. I, I, so I've been looking around. They really haven't. I was kind of looking up some Land Rover history today, and I, I, I'm curious to ask you this. Do you know when the Land Cruiser was introduced to the United States? Um, was it 1950? No, you're close, but not quite. Close? Okay. It was. I, in I, I, I know. I know. It goes back that far. Or yeah, just it was, that far. It was in uh, nineteen. So Toyota in the U.S. opened in nineteen fifty-seven in October thirty-first. So their first full years of sales was um, nineteen fifty-eight. They sold oh, one really Land now. Cruiser. Okay. Wow. <laughs> but. They also only sold 287 other cars. Yeah. So it's not exactly, it's not like they were new to the game. They were new to the game in 1957, 1958. And um, that model was called, uh, that was the 20 series, kind of the, the FJ20, if you will. Um, in 1960, that's when the FJ40, which is kind of, if you think about an old school Land Cruiser, that's the one that right. existed. My that's uncle, what, that's what I, pops in my head. Yeah. So I only found this out when my grandmother died, but my uncle had an FJ40 because my aunt, she went through like a lot of his stuff and was like pulling out pictures and stuff. And he had one, um, obviously later than 1960. I think his was in the mid seventies or so, but you know, th that was, that was for a while, for several years, that was Toyota's best-selling vehicle in the United States. Um, I'm looking actually at the numbers now. The FJ40, 
from 1960 to 1965 was Toyota's best-selling vehicle in the United States. And after that, the Corona passenger car took over. So for five years in the early 60s, if you ask someone, what's a Toyota look like? It's an FJ40, um, you know, which you wouldn't think about today. Because A, I, you know, I've always lived on the East Coast. They were very much a West Coast car, like just because that's where Toyota dealers were. That's where that's where they were kind of dropped off. So, you know, it, it, but it was it was a very different vehicle back then than it is today, isn't it? Yes. Um, I, mean, we're, yeah. I mean, we're I mean, we're, we're kind of taking a look and we're taking a look at an older Land Cruiser here right now. But, I mean, there's there's some I mean, it's not huge Toyota brandy, but there's some Toyota branding going on up there in the grill. There's a little that, bit. That, that, that new GR. I mean, can you say maybe it has a little bit of a retro feel? No, I don't know if it's retro. No, no, that's it's, more of an FJ Cruiser thing. The FJ Cruiser was retro, and it's it's not retro at all. But I, I mean, when I think Toyota Toyota Land Cruiser, this is still what pops into my head. And I know there have been many, many variations over the years. And I know the the most recent one here in the United States. I mean, that's, I mean, let's let's be honest. I mean, that's why Toyota isn't going to sell the new one here because right now the Toyota Land Cruiser is like an eighty five thousand dollar. SUV. I mean, that's and they I mean, sell a couple of thousand every year. The yeah, sales are incredibly low. They're not selling that many. And when Toyota has a luxury division called Lexus, right? I mean, that that that's why that's why it's it's to me. I mean, it's pretty much guaranteed. We'll at least get this has a Lexus, where maybe that price tag is a little bit more befitting. And I don't know if it'll if it'll bring more sales, but hey. You know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, right? So let me pull, uh, while we're talking about this, let me pull this story up that we ran okay. a little bit ago. There's a rumor that Lexus is planning to do a Halo off-road SUV. And after seeing this new um, uh, Land Cruiser, I wonder if those two projects aren't somehow related. That Lexus would do, you know, this super crazy off-roader and it would basically be the ultimate land cruiser for the united states um how did i miss this rumor uh you know what let vamp for me for just a second while i look it up because i know i'm the one that I wrote mean, it up i mean uh, i know i've been sick here for for i mean i was only sick for okay i was sick for like a day or two but it really kind of kicked my butt for about a week but i don't remember hearing anything about this are we talking recent or are we talking you know like a, like a few months ago i mean admittedly writing four or five news articles a day things kind of blend together pretty quick um i would i actually maybe i do remember something about it now um i mean i would love to see some sort of halo off-roader like a land cruiser of old that that Here. was just out to conquer wranglers and broncos well it um, sounds like it's gonna be, it sounds like this right? is going to be more of, of the lexus g class for lack of a better describer so um as you can see so for anyone not watching on youtube the headline of this story is lexus dealers say new three-row crossover off-road suv and ev are coming and this is from february of 2021 so this I, year, I remember I, I remember this now that i see it but yeah so this year but you know yep. whatever and basically one of the the people involved says that lexus is working on a rugged off-road vehicle they're saying it's going to be a low val volume halo vehicle um and that it's vastly different from what people usually expect from a lexus and i wonder if lexus isn't going to take this new land cruiser and basically add everything that they can to it, everything <laughs> that they can to it that's available. They'll sell it for a six figure price. You know, very few will get made, but it will be kind of Lexus's halo vehicle that says here we can build an off road or two. Ah, the, the trouble that I have with that are Lexus buyers interested in off road. Probably not. Lexus buyers aren't, but I wonder if they think that they can get enough conquest buyers out there. Pull it, pull in somebody that might maybe go for a for a, a Range Rover or something. Exactly. And this is another story. Lexus could launch luxurious body on frame off roader that's separate from the LX. 
um, Anthony wrote this, uh, and that was in January. So only a month previous to that other February report that we put up. So there does seem to be some kind of thing that while we might not see this vehicle in the U.S. as a land cruiser, we could see it as a super rugged off-road Lexus, um, just as kind of them putting their stake in the ground saying, hey, we can do this too. You know, you might not think of Mercedes-Benz as building rugged vehicles, but they have the G-Class. We can build something like that too. Yeah, but the, I mean, the G-Class has been established for a long time. They, have a, they already have an audience built in. Sure. Rain, Range Rover that they already have an audience built in. I can see Lexus wanting to try and I can see Lexus thinking, okay, if everybody else is doing this, um, you know, maybe we should try, but man, I, if, if they do it, I don't think it'll be, if I don't think it'll work. I don't think it'll work. I just don't think the Lexus audience um, cares enough about that. And the, the audience that is interested in something like that, they're going to put their money where they already know what they're going to get. They're already going to go for G class. They're already going to go for Range Rover. It just, it it feels like Lexus may be trying to take a stab at an area that's that it's just not their market, you know? Yeah. And you know what? Maybe that's exactly what will happen. I mean, I'm I'm happy to see it though. Yeah. The more the merrier. Yeah. No, I'm happy to see more of, of this GR Land Cruiser. Yeah, God, that's a good looking car. They, uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's amazing how big of a difference you can make. Just, I mean, it's not necessarily some minor changes, but I mean, you've got the Toyota branding up front. Do you have details on on what makes this? What else makes this a little different? You know, I know, I, I'm, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I, I went over, I went over the de- debut post here earlier. Yeah, today. I don't think we know specifically yet. Um, this was this was a little odd. Can I can I take a just a brief minute for a, what were you thinking? Yeah, we're rambling about cars. Let's do we're, it. We're rambling about cars. Okay. Um, this this will be a little bit of inside baseball, but it affects it affects everybody because we're talking about flow of information. So, um, as is often the case, there are embargoes um, that we'll get from automakers. Hey, don't talk about this until X amount of time when information mm-hmm. is released. Yep. Um, yep. Totally normal. With 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 the Land Cruiser not coming to the United States, I, I mean, obviously people are still interested to read about it in the United States. And mm-hmm. Motor One, we also have a, a very wide uh, ranging audience all around the globe. So we're obviously thirsty for information. We want to have this information available as soon as embargo lifts. So um, fortunately, we had everything written up, ready to go. We had the information, but as Bruce was saying, there's still a lot of information that needs to filter out, and maybe that will change depending on various locations. Um, but two hours before the embargo was supposed to lift, we get an email from Toyota. Not just an uh, not, email, like their official press release. Well, yeah, like, like the like, oh, hey, guys. Yeah, no, like no, the official is- announcement from Toyota <laughs> yeah. two hours before the embargo of hey we're announcing the new land cruiser and it's like okay you know what's going on here and and we had heard that toyota was still wanting people to to follow the embargo and it's like in some regions not necessarily us but yeah other places around the world that we have additions in they're like no 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 no, don't publish that but we're like but and and this happens this things like this happen from time to time automakers will have information that they want embargoed in certain areas, but not others. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's just the way they want to control that information is just absurd. It's just, it's absolutely absurd. If you are going to send out and make public official information, that's it. It's out there. It's out there for the entire world. So that, that was, that was a little bit of what we ran into today. It's like, Okay, Toyota. I mean, we're doing exactly what you wanted us to do, but now you you just you want to be the source of this information that normal people aren't going to be able to get because they're looking to um, outlets like us to to tell them what's going on. Anyways, Toyota, what were you thinking? It was automakers' a weird decision on Toyota's part, and we're see- you know, yep. and and automakers, if you have information, okay, if you have information that you are wanting to share understand that once you share it it's there 
I would put it a different way. Understand that the internet is a global thing and understand that if you put out information on your English language and Japanese language websites, that people from all over the world could conceivably access that information and that there is no sense of putting that information under embargo in another language's mm -hmm. language. So, that it, it, yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, in short... Decide when you want to tell the world about your big announcement and then make the big announcement. Yeah. It's really simple. But don't say you, English language speaking people can know about it this time. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah this is totally hypothetical. Italian speaking people can know about it at this time. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make sense. That's not the way the internet works. Yeah. St stop throwing the needle. It's not, uh, it, it's not 1962. Right. We are we are a global community. We are a global economy. You can't uninvent that unless uh, unless you take away all of our toys, and that's not going to happen anytime soon. So, right. Toyota, what were you thinking? Yeah, now, Toyota, this is the baby. What were you thinking? Like you, it's the, ba you the baby. The baby. Weird what were you stuff. Thinking? This isn't like a major one, but we're happy. Kinda, that was we're dumb. happy that you have this new Land Cruiser. We're happy. Uh, we're really happy, and we want to know more about the the GR version here. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I mean, you have one, give Smith and I the keys to one because we would love to drive one. I mean, I'm not remotely located in any region where there could be some epic off roading trails <laughs> with some of the most fantastic <laughs> views in the entire world. I, I mean, I'm I'm nowhere near stuff like that. Nope. Not uh, not, not in the not, not in the Black Hills of South Dakota with one, two, three national parks like two hours away from me. No, that those would be terrible places to drive an off-roading vehicle. Can't <laughs> Bruce, I mean, I mean, you're you're a bigger Land Cruiser fan than I am. So I have to be I, totally I, 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 honest I with you. you. My Land Cruiser experiences are very small. My wife, my a coworker of my wife, her husband had one, and I got to ride in it once, and I fell in love with it. And his was like an early '90s example, like a '92 mm -hmm. or '93. The other experience I had in one was just a couple of years ago, ago, but it was even shorter. It was a ride in one from uh, Cobo Hall in Detroit to the hotel I was staying at in Detroit. So it was maybe a 15 minute ride, but I just. There's something to me that I really like about Toyota kind of pushing the limits of, and I, this is true of any automaker. I like an automaker who pushes the limits in terms of what people can do with a vehicle, what people want from a vehicle, whether that's a supercar or an SUV or a commuter car or whatever. And to me, the Land Cruiser really does that. And that makes it attractive to me. Thanks. That's what I got, bud. No arguments here. No arguments here. We're going to be standing by for our, for more information from Toyota on this. Yeah, and and when that comes up, MotorOne.com, we we have uh, we have our teeth into everything. Um, we have branches all around the world, so we're, we're constantly sharing information, and uh, we appreciate you coming along for the ride, both at MotorOne.com and at Rambling About Cars. Bruce, do do we want to actually tell people here at the end of this episode? Uh, a little bit of change that's happening on YouTube. We do, but, but you know what? This just popped into my head. I'm going to do this and then I'll do that. Okay. Just real quick. Hey, Toyota, bring us a Bronco slash a Wrangler competitor. Bring us a true FJ cruiser, a baby yeah. FJ. So a baby land cruiser. Like, that'd be fantastic. Just do that. Um, but yeah, anyway. So back to what you were talking about. Right. To anyone who watches this on YouTube, we have a new channel. Um, we are no longer going to be on the Motor One main channel. We are going to be on a new channel called Motor One Podcasts. And again, all for us, this, uh, all for us, all for any future podcast that ends up happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything's actually happening, but you know, maybe we're going to do a trucks podcast one day. Maybe whatever. Um, all Motor One podcasts will be at the Motor One Podcast channel. And, um, and that's and that's exactly what it is. I, I think you, YouTube dot com slash Motor One Podcasts. I, I as far as I know, that is what the URL is going to be. But um, we'll make sure we have we have links in the video. We'll make right. sure there are links at uh, at Motor One dot com, and you will still be able to see something at least for a little while on the main YouTube channel. Right. Um, so at, at advertising the new channel. That's very important. The takeaway: we're growing. Motor One is growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so. 
Here's where we really need your help. We want to make sure that the new Motor One podcast channel gets out there to everybody. So go to the channel. You'll be able to see all of the past episodes of Rambling About Cars as well, I, I believe. I believe they're going to take over all of the old, old Motor One podcasts before it was Rambling About Cars. Don't quote Maybe. me on that. Don't yeah. quote me on that just yet. Um, I, I mean... The uh, it's an active situation, right? But point certainly being, all of the podcasts that you yes. have seen with Smith and I that have been recorded and been on YouTube, they are still going to be on YouTube. They're just going to be on Motor One podcast rather than the Motor One channel. And to make it explicitly, explicitly clear, this only affects the YouTube channel. If you are right. listening to us in any audio way, that doesn't change at all. Just just keep listening. We appreciate you. That. It doesn't Absolutely. change. It's only Spotify, the video version of this show. Spotify, Apple. I, I think those are, are the two primary. Those uh, are the primary uh, ones that we are on other stuff on. too. Yeah. But anywhere else you're listening, right. We're still going to be there and we still appreciate you coming along for the yeah. ride. Even Ferrari guy and Jason. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <sighs> what Do else we, we got, have, man? No, I think that's it. But yeah, it, it, I just. Again, I need to just make it explicitly clear. If you are watching us on YouTube, we are moving to Motor One Podcast. If you are listening to us in any other way, this change does not affect you at all. Right. It's just, it's just a channel change. That's it. Yep. Um, but otherwise, yeah, as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Whenever you happen to be listening to us, we really appreciate it. We love hearing your comments. We love hearing your criticism. We love getting your support. We love getting your emails, whatever it is. We honestly love this because Smith and I, we do this purely out of our passion for just sitting down on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night and talking about cars. Like, I want people to think of this as when you and your buddy are sitting out on the gar sitting out in the garage, drinking a few beers and talking about cars. That's what this show is supposed to be. You know, maybe it's, you know, guys who are writing about news every day, automotive news, but I, it shouldn't be more formal than that. It just should be us sitting here just BSing about cars. And that's 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 what we want. And we appreciate all of you that come along. So, yeah. Take Smith, care. Is there anything more to say? Um, you know what? If you want to catch us on social media, um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm at CH Reading on Twitter. I'm Chris Bruce, Bruce 1985 on Twitter. And I, I need to get a little bit more active on Twitter. So if you want to follow me, I'm going to start putting up some... You know what? I'm I'm gonna start this week. I'm gonna start posting up some of the random photos of some of the cars I've owned over the years. So oh, I'll actually at, be able at, to do that. At CH Writing, you've heard me talk about my eclectic car history. I'm actually not kidding when I say I've owned I think 33 or 34 cars. Um, for a while, I was just going like every six to eight months. It's like I had it, it's an addiction, man. It's just a cheap car addiction. I would love to find these cheap cars that you could buy for five, six, seven hundred bucks. They were running and driving, but maybe they needed some love. You put two brand new cars on a dealership lot. They're identical. You take those same two cars, separate them by 20 years. They're completely different with their own characters. I love learning about those individual car characters. And that's where most of those uh, ownership experiences came from. So I'm going to start posting some photos, just talking a little bit about some of those cars at CH Writing. Um, on Twitter and Bruce, it looks just about dark at your house. So it, I think yeah, it's time going down ish, but I think it's, I think it's time to cap this off. Yeah, I think it's time again. Thanks everyone to listening for, to listen to F. Yeah. Thank you everyone for <laughs> listening to us. Um, Bruce has been in the beer a little bit too much already. I have not Stop that. <laughs> I'm a good boy, <laughs> but thank you everyone. Good night and goodbye. We'll see ya.